It's certainly one of those things that, you know, as we mentioned before, the technology piece that, that poses a threat, if, if that does become an issue, they've really got to do something to kind of figure out how they can still provide the same value, but maybe with a different energy source. So. And it is kind of a flex fuel cell in some ways. I mean, you can use um, biogas, you can use um, other sorts of kind of agricultural uh, gases, but you know, natural gas is obviously the most popular. I also have a second question that's about the payback time, which is 10 years, if I understood it correctly. Um, the area is moving quite um, fast for the future. Don't you think that 10 years is a bit too long, the payback time? If I can I just put it for a second. If I can refer you to this, um, and I, I actually meant to caveat my analysis by saying that I wasn't going to be able to cover all the contingencies that we took into account here. But as you can see here, it's a dynamic curve. So, you know, 10 years is at the zero point. So, you know, we essentially, in order to generate the market capture, we would say, all right, so the uh, residential new construction market here in blue, at one year of payback, you can expect to capture roughly 98% of the market. And down, and down, and down, and down, and down, and down. So 10 years, you're absolutely right, zero. No one's taking it into account. And you know, it gets below 30% quickly for all market sizes at around six. So I agree, it is certainly it's too long when they back. 10 years was our cutoff in terms of potential markets. Yeah. May I ask a question? My name is Pat Johnson. I also represent um, iTech, uh, just like Lima. Uh, which we will present later on. I have a question regarding the uh, again the um, energy sources. Uh, you referred to your research and you presented that uh, customers are not happy with fluctuating energy uh, prices. So my question would be: Have gas prices uh, demonstrated to be more stable than electricity prices, for example, over time? Well, I mean. You can use a, about a 10% energy inflation rate over time. That's been relative. I mean, if you look over a 10-year window, especially over the last four years, that's held consistent. Natural gas prices really took were really low in price for through the 2000s. They were really low in price, and then had a little slight uptick over the last few years. I, it's I think it's more stable. Um, the U.S. still has a significant supply of natural gas. There's even talks to build out a, a pipe, pipeline through Alaska, but it's, you know it's hesitant. But um, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, I do believe it's natural gas is more stable than electricity. Thank prices. you. Okay. Any more questions? I can ask. Two oh. questions. Uh, my name is Olaf. Uh, I work with Tarus. Um, have you investigated the price versus volume uh, function in terms of the cost of the product? I mean, we know approximately that every time you double the volume, you have at least a 20% cost reduction. Economies of scale weren't taken into account. We're not. We're not. Okay. I, you know, I, I think we, there's a number of factors that can help us in these numbers. Economies of scale is certainly one of them. As you sell more, cost reduces, profit margins increase, obviously. Um, there is the potential uh, somewhat lack of natural gas availability in very select areas. Um, I was living in New York City for the last three years. that would have a large impact on this curve you have here. So, I mean, the pricing on the product initially affects the market penetration. So that's rather fundamental, isn't it? Um, well, I think these were created based upon the prices that we were given. Yeah, and we were also told to only look at three to five years market potential. So we're really looking at that kind of first, the doctor group. Um, so that's what our analysis numbers were based on, just the, that time period and what the price of payback will be during that time. But you're right, it would significantly change. And, and this also, we, we don't have um, a really much cost information because this is such a prototype, you know, it's very much a prototype at this point. Um, so as I think Anna mentioned, you know, this is still very much in the beginning stages of looking at whether this is going to be a partnership or not. Um, 
there are a lot of details that still have to be worked out in terms of their supply chain and also just, you know, if this is going to be more owned by one company, if it's going to be a separate new joint venture, you know, the, a new company is created outside of the two companies. So there's still a lot of question marks in terms of, of how that's going to work. Probably the huge, at least the largest cost element. Is that correct? We don't have a cost breakdown right now, but I, I would. We shouldn't dig into that. Yeah. We know for sure that fuel cells mass production has very large cost benefits. So, so that could be studied at another stage. Hmm. The other final question then: um, Which one of the market resistances you presented is the largest resistance in in your understand the question? Mm -hmm. No. I mean, to really come into the market, to penetrate, to open up the market, which is the most important thing to do? Of our six recommendations, yeah. is that yeah. what you're to? I mean, I think when you talk to the distributors, their biggest concern is the unknowns that are out there. Because um, as you ask these questions, you can get access to the market. So right. I mean, the incentives are varying per state. The cost varies per state and by size. Um, the life cycle is a little unknown. The maintenance costs are a little unknown. So you have some great market reputation in terms of what's been done on a large scale, commercial or industrial level with fuel cell technology. Um, but this is so new. So when you're dealing with this three to five year early adopter market people who are willing to pay the price. It's that concern of what are the results and how can I see this prototype being demonstrated and, and how can I see its performance. So I think, you know, of everything, really getting a model on the market um, that people can see and, and, and really understand that's going to be truly imperative. So assuming you have an early adopter to distribute this to keep up, that's what you said. Sure. Thank you. If I can just leave everybody with, with one last thing, you know, kind of relative to your comment about maybe the improved market potential uh, for economies of scale, maybe a, a more limited market potential given certain natural gas restrictions. These numbers are very conservative. We kind of always took the, let's just go baseline, let's see, at worst case scenario, what this is going to pan out to be. We don't even include state incentives in this. In the state of New York, when you install a fuel cell in your home, you get $1,500 tax rebate. That changes everything. It reduces payback time, increases market potential. So overall, in the net, while we haven't taken everything into account, we feel like there is more things that we didn't take into account that help us, help these numbers, than <coughs> detract from them. Okay. I have one last question. Uh, this is an American and Swedish company working with R&D together, the way I understand it. Do they get any support from the uh, U.S. or Swedish authorities or funding or based on that it's a Swedish-American R&D program? Um, well, right now they're not. E it's not even like a formal joint venture. I'm not, okay. So, so there's no. Yeah, there's still. I mean, if they decide to move forward with this product, then they'll have to figure out is this a formal joint venture or where would they? Um, but yeah. Plug Power, the, the U.S. partner, um, has, Aaron mentioned, like two or three generations that they've already put out on their fuel cell, fuel cell technology. They do have a micro CHP unit that they sell, um, and they also have just a, a bigger, just more general CHP unit that, that's done on a commercial level. And so they actually have seen pretty significant success in um, working with the EPA or working with um, the Department of Energy in, in different ways to get government grants to do big installations, especially in the Northeast. So they've got that experience, which is really helpful. Um, I think that if they do go into this joint venture, that it, it'll be the climate wealth benefit to have somebody like that in their corner. And the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which is essentially the, the bailout plan, shells out billions of dollars for energy uh, development. There's got to be a way that public power can you know, leverage its U.S. presence to capitalize on some of that grant money, even just to get the venture started. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.